Welcome to episode 27 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Join, as always, by my co-host, a woman who is single-handedly putting the Canadian beer industry out of business by doing dry February, the great Mary, all business, Fincher. Good, have, good, good evening, Mary. How are you doing today? <laughs> I mean, you were. <laughs> Let us proceed to the podcast immediately. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? <laughs> oh, swimmingly. Just peachy. Absolutely peachy. Everything's going great. It's fabulous. So we had, um, we had a good live. We, always we did. Kind of tip, we had a, I thought it was a really good one. Yep. Um, good day. It's too bad that the rest of the country is um, this freezing and crappy as I yeah. sit here in a 50 degree Massachusetts day in February, which is weird, but hey, yeah. we'll take it. We'll take it. But, um, but yeah. no, it certainly, certainly is. It certainly is. <laughs> But this begins a pretty busy week for the old breakfast club. It okay. does, yes. By the time this drops on Saturday, we'll have had our um, our fifth round table, which is tomorrow yeah. as we record this. And then we're going to have some fun over the weekend again. So I think we have a lot of good things coming. And um, you know what's great about tonight, by the way? Nothing against these like, about Valentine's Day or John Wilkes Booth. But we get to go back into battles today. I know. I'm really excited about this. The only battles we've had lately are the ones you've been hitting me with. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting actually into the old Civil War again. But we haven't done, it feels like I haven't done that in a while. He's still... lying. <laughs> All business. He's exaggerating. No, 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 no. Not you, but right? I, no, not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. But yeah, but I think, you know, we're going to talk tonight. We're going to take it old school again. We're going to go right at the beginning. We're going to go back to the Western theater, which mm-hmm. we've been spending a lot of time out in the West. And we're going to talk about the very right beginning of the Ulysses S. Grant legend, right? Yep. Which is going to be Fort Henry and then mostly Fort Donaldson and kind of what he did to make a name for himself. It really, the early stages of the Civil War gave Lincoln somebody in the West and really an overall general that he could really count on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is kind of where, as you said, the, the legend of Grant begins. It's in the Western theater and it's uh, it's quite, Donaldson and Henry are a very interesting study. I mean, like you and I both spent hours and hours on this one re- and without realizing, I think, how much there was as we were researching it, right? Like there's just, there's actually a lot to this. And it's, I don't know, to me, it almost seems like all you hear about with it is Grant's surrender or not grant surrender, but the surrender that, you know, on conditional I was going to say, grant. I must have researched a different battle. I, <laughs> no, I didn't surrender mine. I mean, I mean, he becomes on conditional surrender. Does, you, does, your have, does yours have UFOs too? Fucker. Okay. But, um, but right. But what this does is you're, you're absolutely right though. People study Fort Donaldson and they, they know about the unconditional surrender and yeah. they know about that, but they don't know how it builds into that. And we're going to talk a little bit about this and how close it came for Grant to not become Grant in this battle, which people mm-hmm. I think don't really know no, about and, some of the things we do. And there's a lot of names that we discovered in this battle that don't get mentioned a lot, but probably deserve a little bit more mention, you know, like Lou Wallace of all people. We will talk about Lou Wallace today. You're right. He's absolutely involved in this. And I'm curious to see how you get, oh, Howard into this one. Cause I'm not sure how you're going to pull this one. I was thinking about that. I don't know how I'm going to. <laughs> I don't to. think you could be able to do As it close as I've got is in my name, the O and O Henry. <laughs> oh, well, I guess that's that. That's well, let's it. kind of paint the picture of what was going on at the time. So yep. before, before, so this, this all takes place in February of 1862. Before February of 1862, out back in the West, there wasn't a heck of a lot going on. Um, there was a city called Cairo, Illinois, which was the most south, most southernest, basically Union city in, um, at, at the time. And it was a little bit north of a bunch of rivers that really was that Mississippi and Tennessee River network. And even back then, um, well, they, back then for sure, they knew the importance of these rivers because these rivers were the highways of today. You couldn't get anywhere without controlling these rivers. Um, so really, we mentioned the Mississippi and the Tennessee. And really by controlling these rivers, what it really did, it it would help disrupt the rebel supply lines. It would also allow you to move your armies up and down the rivers. And and if you're fighting on the out west, I mean, and fighting the south, you had to have it. There was no question. Mm -hmm. At the time though, the army and the Navy weren't as close as they probably could have been, right? So, but they did ultimately want to launch launch a joint attack down these rivers in 1862. and, And it really, 
because of two people that we're going to talk about. U.S. Grant, which we've already mentioned, um, and Andrew Foote, mm-hmm. who is a, a Navy flag officer. So they're close. And it's kind of unusual at the time for that to happen just because the way it was. So their, their relationship really is really was the key to this entire thing because it allowed them to be able to use an Overland campaign and a, and a water campaign. Um, and, it really, and it was really a fascinating study as you go through to see how it worked out. It was when I talk about two forts that you had to have, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Yeah, and Fort Donaldson, um, Grant said that it was the gate to Nashville, which was a place of great military and political importance. So not only is the Union trying to get a hold of these rivers, so they want the Mississippi, but they also need the Tennessee and they need the Cumberland as well. Um, but they also are going to go after Nashville and they want to somehow get the rebels out of Kentucky too, because somehow they've got up into like Kentucky. As well, well, Kentucky was supposed to be a neutral territory. It was, yep. it was supposed to be it, uh, the, the Rebs violated, but speaking of the Rebs, just an idea of what they were doing to do. The Rebs knew they had to protect these rivers too. They had a lot of problems though going for them. So they had some f- primarily used forts to defend these rivers down in the Tennessee and the, um, the Cumberland river. We're going to talk about, but also the Mississippi, the Mississippi had the better forts. Yep. The Tennessee and the Cumberland, the forts were not were not all that great. No, and they were hastily um, constructed too at the beginning of the Civil War. Right. When we talk about these forts, we're not talking about you know Fort Sumter here. We're talking about wood and logs and earthworks piled up, and, and that's what it was. But the funny part about it, though, is when you look back on it, they should have defended them better because the, the area on the Tennessee and the Cumberland, it was a strong producer of grain, horses, mules all kinds of stuff. It was also a strong iron producer at the time. Mm-hmm. So the iron works in Clarksville, Tennessee, last trade to Clarksville. To Clarksville. Mary, <laughs> there you go. I, read that. I want to see if you were daydream believing and not paying attention, <laughs> but that's okay. But that was the, that iron works in Clarksville was the second most, most biggest iron works uh, to the Tredegar in, in Richmond. So it, it was important. Um, Nashville, as you mentioned, was a huge gunpowder town. Um, so that's, what you had in that area. Defending that whole area was a guy named Albert Sidney Johnson from Kentucky. And we're going to talk a lot about him, educated at Transylvania University, Mary. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then he eventually went to West Point. You know who he was a classmate with at Transylvania University? Oh, was it Davis? Jefferson Davis. Yes. All right. Jefferson Davis. He was a classmate of his. He eventually went to West Point. He graduated eighth. Uh, of a class of 41. Um, they said he was tall, great sense of humor. Davis loved him, said he was a great soldier, um, uh, the ablest man, civil or military, Confederate or federal. So Davis definitely liked him. He was also a veteran of the Black Hawk War. Ooh, the Black, so, the Black there Hawk. There you go, right there. So make sure you enunciate. But basically, Johnson, you know, he ran that Western military department, which stretched from the Appalachians all the way to the Ozarks, which is a huge 500 mile battle line, had 70,000 men defending it, Mm -hmm. but it was thin and there was really no action going on back there at the time. Um, The Union knew you had to have it, though. So Henry Halleck, who was commanding the Western Theater, we'll talk about him briefly, he... um, you know, he was in charge. He was, you know, he was in charge of that Western Thirty. He was, he was basically there, but not present in any of these battles. He was whatever he was doing. But he was a guy who we talked a lot about him, who became quite jealous and envious when the subordinates got credit, and it was what's what was what's going to ultimately get him. Yeah, his rivalry he had with U.S. Grant, with Don Carlos Carlos Buell. Um, I mean, basically, it was. Um, you know, it, it was it ended up being stuff of legend that they would talk about. Don Carlos Buell, Department of the Ohio. He, you know, he he's coming off a victory at Mill Springs, and, and and he was he was basically doing his own thing in that that part of the country as well. Lincoln, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln. He wanted to be attacked, and he wanted to go, so he wanted to attack in this area. But but the hard time he had was coming up with someone to come up with a battle plan because they just all didn't get along. No, it was like just this kind of this contest of egos especially between Halleck and Buell and you know Grant does go to Halleck to present him with a plan and Halleck basically just brushes him off like says you know this isn't gonna happen and 
he goes back to Caro. I think it's Carol, right? That he goes back to completely like just Caro. You know what? You know what he says? He says the he says the plan is preposterous. Yeah, that's the word he used. Preposterous. He barely lets Grant explain, and Grant just kind of goes back like he and, and Grant kind of takes some of the fault into himself and says like. Well, it might have been the way that I explained it. You know, maybe I wasn't being clear enough, but still Grant is pretty dejected when he leaves Halleck. And Mm -hmm. he says of this time, like from the Battle of Belmont until early February, 1862, the troops under my command did little except prepare for the long struggle, which proved to be before them. So he has no idea when anything is going to happen at all. Yeah. So so let's talk about Grant's plan. So the plan that he presents to Halleck, he wants to take, he wants to take Andrew Foote with him he wants to sail down the Tennessee River. He wants to capture Fort Henry, which is a small of the fort on the, the Tennessee River. Then he wants to basically use that to kind of as a springboard to take Fort Donaldson. Mm-hmm. And he says, but how does come around though? He does finally change his mind. I mean, for Grant, there's a million reasons why Grant wants to do this. You know, his reputation has been sullied. He wants to redeem himself. Um, he's got this drinking thing hanging over him still. He's got a lot. Of, he just, he needs to, he, he's the point of his life now. He's back in the army. He needs to prove himself. Lincoln loved Grant at the beginning. He didn't complain. He didn't ask for reinforcements all the time. Um, and and he and they both knew, Grant and Foot both knew, they were, they were right about this, that Fort Henry and, and Donaldson, for that matter, with a weak spot in Sidney Johnson's line, and they yep. knew it. Yeah, and, and they knew they knew it had to be attacked. Yeah, and they the one of the reasons that it's a weak spot is not just because of kind of the the terrain. Like the forts are very poorly constructed. It was actually Bushrod Johnson who, um, he's a uh, good old Bushrod is back we'll be here for bush rod later he's actually he was an engineer at the time in the confederate army and he is one Mm -hmm. of the ones in charge of um constructing these forts and it was said by uh general lloyd tyman who will be in charge at one of the forts um he said that the uh i think it was fort henry had with was without one redeeming feature and the history of military engineering records no parallel in this case so it's very shitty construction but not only that like Johnson is telling, um, you know, both uh, General Polk as well as General Time. Um, I can't talk tonight, General Tyman, to or not Tyman Tillman, right? Go on. I can't talk tonight. <laughs> she says, "Say Massachusetts." Yeah, Massachusetts. <laughs> hey, you did it. No. Um, so General Tillman, he's telling them that they need to keep a vigilant eye on ten on the Tennessee River fortify opposite Fort Henry, no time should be lost. That's what um, uh, Johnson is going to write to Polk on October 17th, 1861, nothing happens from that. And he warns him again on October 31st, 1861, he sends a message this time to Tillman. The utmost vigilance is enjoined as there have been gross negligence in this request. You will push forward the completion of the works and armament with the utmost activity. So in other words, get your shit together that doesn't happen and in january of 1862 he sends tillman one final message occupy and entrench the heights opposite fort henry do not lose a moment work at night so johnson's getting an idea that something is up with the federals and they're going to try and attack no and to your point fort henry is a shitty place i mean as Mm -hmm. far as how it's built together it's it's built basically on on a low bank it's below sea level it's dominated by surrounding hills um they were the subject of flooding all the time, which we're going to find out about. Um, you know, J- City Johnson, they, they knew they were in trouble at that fort. They just knew they were. Um, so did Jefferson Davis. I mean, mm-hmm. he basically knew that in that area, that was the soft underbelly of the Confederacy at that time. Now they're getting you know, success in the East that's going on, but this is kind of like the blind spot and they know that they're weak there. Um, the other issue they had was the weaponry. Exactly. They, they, just did, they didn't have any, I mean, you basically had antiquated weapons. Um, they were, they requested weapons from John, from Davis. They ain't, they ain't got any Davis send you. Davis so, like, I don't even fucking send you. You know, because, well, you know, so, and also the other thing that's going against them too is Albert City Johnson. You meant, you know, you mentioned um, Thielman, but Johnson is preoccupied with Columbus and Bowling Green. Mm-hmm. A little bit, a little bit of the, the, the north there. So, yeah. so the focus is not there. So you've got a bad, you know, you've got a bad construction of this fort right on the river, bad weapons. Um, you've got a focus. You you know you don't have the focus from the you know, from the government, 
and you've got a union general who's got a you know who's got a you know an attitude who wants to prove himself so you can yeah. go to sort of see where this one's going right and, and so when this whole thing gets started um it's february 5th 1862 they basically are going to put the troops on the boats and they're going to sail down the river and, and it, they're going to have uh, all of foot's ironclads and have three gunboats as well made of wood you're going to have fifteen thousand men they're going to have and they're going to land a few miles south of fort henry and the plan is pretty simple it's basically drop you guys off we're going to sail near fort henry and we're going to pound you with artillery meanwhile grant's going to come from the south and he's going to take henry from the rear there you go <laughs> going in the back door gonna, again yeah exactly yes poor and henry what, poor henry right? <laughs> and but 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 what's going to happen is um and, and so it's it's going to put them in a bad situation now that well this is all going on now you flip to february 6th um it rains so it's just so much weather controls all these battles it's just it comes the worst place the worst time yeah so it starts to rain so what happens as i mentioned before about the flooding fort henry gets flooded the whole lower level gets flooded only nine of the guns are above the water and even then the water is almost there and it's right. threatening to get at like you know kind of just the rest of the ammo that they have as well mm -hmm. and so you know the union guns will have the ability to fire twice as many as they can they, so then that's that's a bad math equation um you know, uh, Fort Henry's commander, Lloyd Tillman, he, from, he's a Maryland guy, by the way, who got later would be killed at Vicksburg at Battle of Champion Hill. He, he realized that this is this is a disaster. So what he does is he takes his entire 25-man, 2,500-man garrison and sends them to Fort Donaldson and says, Vaya con Dios. It's 12 miles away. Go. He's going to leave one artillery company behind to delay the Federals and defend the fort. Yeah. So you know again it gets even worse so but to their credit mary they fight for two solid hours they do boats, and right? they're being pounded by the ironclads it's foot's flagship cincinnati that fires the first shot and that's the signal to the rest of the ironclads there's four of them in total to start firing at the fort yeah. but yeah as you said you know these men like in fort henry they put up a pretty good fight considering they're they are in water that is like up to their knees so I oh. guess I would be, would have been completely submersed. Oh, you'd be you'd be, you'd be like a mermaid. <laughs> but but the thing is, is like the the weather is helping the Confederates in a way though, because mm -hmm. it's keeping Grant from getting there. Grant's doing his own mud march; he can't make it. You know, he's he's stuck in the he's stuck in the swamps. But the guns are doing all the work because there's no one to stop in there. So, event, but <laughs> like I said, the, to give the the rebels credit with the guns, they do damage the Essex, the Cincinnati. Um, the Carondelet gets hit. They'll repair that one for the next the next battle. But there's that one story where the one shot from the Confederates hits that ship's boiler. The Essex, and yeah. scalds 20 men to death, which doesn't sound fun Yeah, at all. the stories that I read in um, Winston Groom and Shiloh, of all things, his book about Shiloh, has a really good account of Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. And he talks about, like, the scalding, how men were just found, like whatever they were doing when the moment they got scalded, like, and they were instantly killed, they were still in that position. So there was like the, the pilot of the wheelhouse was standing there, but he was dead. Yeah. You know, right. it's pretty horrific way to die. And actually foot almost dies as well in this, but he manages to jump out, out of a window in the ship. But some of the men that jumped into the water, they ended up drowning too. I mean, it was, it was a bad situation for them. Um, Eventually, though, they do the the, the fort is does get surrendered to the, surrender to the gunboats before Grant's infantry even arrives. Um, and what Foot does, he takes those three wooden gunboats, he sends them up to destroy a railroad bridge that's linking the Columbus to Columbus and Bowling Green, mm -hmm. so he can keep the soldiers away, which ended up proving very smart. And Grant telegraphs Halleck proudly and says, "Fort Henry is ours. I shall take Fort Donaldson on the eighth. He was half right. You get you get the you get the six stone. Um, but again, weather is going to come back now. Weather is going to is going to delay um, the supplies, and it's going to delay their march before Donaldson as um, as they as they're getting ready to go. Yeah. yeah. So the the one thing to note with Fort Henry is that it's taken by naval gunfire alone. Mm -hmm. There's no Union infantry really involved in this battle at all. It's just the it's navy that does that manages to take fort henry um and the other thing too like grant and foot always work very well to, or they did work well together at this battle 
So this is where you see the army and the navy starting to work together on stuff. But they'll have they'll have they'll butt heads later in this battle. Yeah. But but for, yeah. the, but for the most part, it was important as they do it. So so now you get Albert City Johnson now. So now he sees Columbus vulnerable to attack from the rear, um, and he can also see them overwhelming Fort Donaldson and eventually heading towards Nashville. So now Johnson knows you're really in trouble now. So his only real choice is going to be to defend Fort Donaldson. Um, or give up Kentucky, really. It's just one or the other. And that was supposed mm-hmm. to be neutral. But um, he could use the whole army to defend Nashville. He has, he's got that choice. Um, but it led to all kinds of confusions among their subordinates as well. But ultimately, what's going to eventually happen is um, they do have a council, like an emergency, emergency meeting, council of war, if you want to call it on the 7th. Um, this is up at Bowling Green. And they're discussing options. And you know who's at this meeting, Mary, is our friend, Beauregard. Beauregard's there. Yep. He's there. He, he wants, and he wants to, it's funny. All he wants to do is he wants to smash Grant and smash Buell, yeah. which is funny because if he did, this Corinth issue wouldn't happen later on, but that's neither the hitter there. But basically, um, Johnson basically is going to decides, well, what we need to do is we need to put everybody at Donaldson and, and make a real fight. We need to yep. hold it the best we can. Um, He's going to sign John Floyd, who we talked about during our secession episode. He would be the Secretary of War under James Buchanan. Um, he was a wanted man in the North, Mary. Yes. For fraud, he was transferring weapons to Southern arsenals while still the Secretary of War under Buchanan. So he knows that um, he's persona non grata in the North. Yeah. But he's going to be the guy ultimately they put in charge. But, they, but even Lloyd didn't know what was going on because Lloyd thought, Okay, I'm I'm gonna be in charge of Donaldson, but but basically, we're holding this we're holding this temporarily until Johnson could send more guys from Bowling Green. He, he, that's what he's thinking. He doesn't realize those guys aren't coming. It's these guys from Henry and the guys who are already there. So real quick, talk about the 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 I don't know, the brain trust that the Rebs have, which is sing along in this one. So <laughs> so jo- so John Floyd is going to be the guy. Now he is a political general. He is questionable loyalty to the South because because for that reason he's got no military experience they don't like him you could probably not find well at least three out of the four but certainly guys who simply just did not get along so john floyd is the, he's the guy who's going to be in charge okay the second in command is going to be gideon pillow the third is going to be simone bolivar buckner yeah um and the fourth is our friend bushred johnson now buckner and pillow hate each other oh, i mean they do. hate each other yeah in their rivals but they both question, you know, they one of the, you know, it's like when you get your command, it's, uh, you know, your seniority is based on when you got it. There's a, there's a trickle down effect. But the funny part about it is when you look at the order of how, who was controlling. So you have Floyd, Pillow, Buckner, and Johnson. It's the exact opposite of capability. If you really think about it. It, it right? is. And it, it all, the other thing it shows too, is, a, you know, there's a lot of talk about the battle of Chickamauga and how things were in the army of Tennessee with all the infighting with between Bragg and his generals, there is just as much here. Like this is like, I think you made a point when we were talking offline one day um, that, you know, this battle like is like the civil war all in one. Mm -hmm. You have like rivalries happening. You have the Navy, you have infantry, you have miscommunication and all this other stuff. But this infighting that is happening with the Confederates is kind of i don't know to me it's like setting the stage for just how it goes in the western theater for them there's constant infighting you know well i mean the, and then too is, is you have four brigadier generals they should have been better i mean you, you have oh, four yeah. guys legit theoretical guys they just didn't get it they didn't get along and um you know there's that there's that soul there's that story between henry and donaldson with a union um an illinois soldier they they catch a they um they catch a Confederate prisoner of war and they, and the Confederate says, you know, by the, not for nothing, but who's in command of you guys now? And this Illinois guy says, Ulysses Grant is. And the Reb goes, I never heard of him. And the guy says to him, he goes, well, you will, you will know him well soon enough. Which is kind of <laughs> funny. He said that, but the other guy who was with them is a guy we'll talk about is Nathan Bedford Forrest, right? Mm-hmm. Calvary guy, you know, slave owner in Tennessee, original wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He's one of the, the richest rich- men in the Confederacy. <clears throat> He's got money. And, you know, it's, it's interesting um, when you look at this, just his, his own personal history, we're not going to get too, too much on him. His great grandson was the first American general, Nathan Bedford Forrest III, to be killed in World War II. 
Really? So it's, 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 uh, it's interesting when you look at the lineage, right? Mm-hmm. This battle, he kills his first Yankee. He kills a sharpshooter in a tree. And so he actually gets his first Civil War kill. But he, um, he's a guy who basically is the one guy who's consistent throughout this, for better or for worse, because mm-hmm. he, he doesn't like anybody. But he's going he's gonna to do his job. Um, on the Union side, you know, U.S. Grant, he holds his own council of war, decides what do you want to, you know, what are we, what are we doing here for the plan for this Overland attack? So who does he have? He's got John McLaren. Talk about him. He's got Charles F. Smith. And he's got our friend Lou Wallace of Ben Hur fame yeah. that we'll talk about. And, and they're basically going to sit down and they're going to talk about what our plan, what are we going to do? McLaren, shockingly, is the only one who disagrees with the plan. He doesn't want, he wants nothing to do with it. <laughs> this is where the <laughs> you know? the rift between Grant and McLaren begins. This is where Grant starts to question McLaren a little bit, I think. I think if U.S. Grant suggested best flavor of ice cream, he would have hated all of them at this point. Yeah. He just, that's how it was. But Smith and Wallace and Foot, for that matter, they all, yeah, this, was, this sounds like a pretty good plan. Mm-hmm. They're going to use a similar game plan they use on Henry. So basically what they want to do they're going to take the infantry to march the 12 miles east of Donaldson. That's what they're going to do. He's going to leave Lou Wallace behind at Fort Henry to kind of watch the fort. Because he, that, he, doesn't, he doesn't think he needs three divisions because he's thinking this is going to be easy. He's going to have Foot go back up the Tennessee River to the Cumberland River, sail back down to Donaldson. He's going to carry some troops and some supplies. And the plan is when he gets there, he's going to fire a couple of shots at Donaldson for like us. We're here. So the infantry can hear them, know that they're available. And the plan ultimately in Grant's mind is let's use the Navy, pound them into submission, just like we did with Henry, yep. and we'll clean up afterwards. And that's pretty much what the game plan is as this, as this thing gets on. I'm trying to you know, start rolling. Yep. And it starts around, what is it, like February 13th? They start 12th. 12th, they start going. And by February 14th, there's 10,000 Union reinforcements that have arrived. Yep and four ironclads and two gunboats belonging to foot and grant just wants to recreate what he's done at fort henry he thinks it's going to be so simple to do this but it's not now a lot of people say that this is grant shining hour but he comes very close to Mm -hmm. um losing everything here at this well, battle a little bit they, they it's almost like a little march to the sea sort of it's only 12 it miles but yep. they're going to march along the ridge and telegraph roads heading down you know that way um lou wallace like i said is going to get left behind but the weather's going to slow them a little bit because remember yes. he said he was going to take it on the eighth right so now it's the 12th they're finally going to start going their march for the most part is unimpeded when they get about a mile away um mclaren's a uh, vanguard cavalry runs into forest who puts up a pretty good fight about a mile away. Um, now, the different Forrest, we talked before about the weapons being kind of subpar Henry. Mm-hmm. Forrest's got good weapons. He's got those breech-loading rifles. Yep. He's going to dismount. He's going to hold a line for a while. Um, the, the Union has their own worst enemy at times. You've got the 29th Illinois shooting each other, friendly fire. I don't know who the hell's what. So it's a little bit of a mess initially. Um, Grant doesn't want to entrench. He wants to go, go, go. Because he's focusing on speed. And for this reason, a lot of his soldiers are going to make a gigantic mistake here. And they're going to drop their blankets and they're going to drop yep. their coats because they want to be able to go faster. And, and the weather is and mild. Hunk, right? And the weather, the weather is, is the- mild too. It's a lot like right. it was a year later during the mud march. You have this period mm-hmm. in you know February that is unseasonally mild. And as they're marching, obviously, yes, they want to go quicker, as you said, but too, they're thinking like, oh, it's mild. Why do I, I don't need to carry this with me. You know, it's going to impede me anyway. I'm not going to need it, you know, um, but then the weather does turn on them eventually, as we're going to talk about. Exactly. So they finally get there. Eventually, the, the infantry does push a forest back. So he does get moved back. So um, they're going to get about a mile away and they're going to like, a, like a, they're going to surround the city. Uh, surround uh, Dover and Fort Donaldson and kind of pin the, the Rebs back to the Cumberland River. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to have um, McLernan's going to go on the right-hand side and then C.F. Smith's going to be on the left-hand side. Wallace isn't there yet, but he's going he's to be coming. Mm-hmm. So they're going to be coming basically against the lines of, um, of Pillow on the left and then Buckner on the right. So it's going to basically they're going to kind of a standoff. Now, what's interesting about this is we talk about how these battles go down Grant tells them to, he tells, you know, um, 
Smith and McLaren, the same thing was, listen, don't start anything. Okay. We, we, not, we're not all up, up yet. We, you know, foots and boats aren't in position yet. If you run into anybody, just stay, don't do it. So naturally the first thing they do is they start a fight, both of them. Yeah. And so they're told, you know, it's, it's very similar to Gettysburg, you know, don't yep. bring on general engagement, but they, they both do it. So, um, but we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So basically, um, night's going to arrive on that very first night of the 12th. And it's, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's, there's not, there's too late to do anything, but they can see all the rebel campfires everywhere. So they, they know like, okay, at Fort Henry, they took off. They're here. We know mm-hmm. they're here and they're probably going to fight because they have nowhere to run because they're pinned against the river. So as morning turns into night turns into morning, um, you know, Floyd's Virginians are going to arrive. They're hearing sounds of the rebels cheering. That you're hearing Floyd come. I don't know why they're cheering Floyd, but they're cheering. Probably there's more people coming. Um, and and so what this is is basically going to do. This is going to be a battle, which is isn't going to be a battle basically of really infantry versus naval or any of that. It's going to be basically the military going up against rebel defenses. That's 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 the plan. You know, so. Um, when they get when so Grant again tells both of these guys, Smith and McLaren, and you know, when you get there, just demonstrate. Let them know you're there, but just mm-hmm. don't, you know, don't start anything. Um, because they want to test the rebel lines. Um, and then finally, you know, Foot is gonna finally get there yeah. that first time. It's gonna be a little test for a little thing. He's gonna basically um the US uh Carondelet is, is repaired from Fort Henry. Um, and he's gonna be controlled by a guy named Colonel uh Henry Walk is a Virginian guy. And basically they're gonna begin like a diversionary bombardment. Um, basically it's a kind of take the focus a little bit away from the infantry, let the infantry kind of get settled. So you can mm-hmm. let Smith and McLaren and kind of get that semicircle around the rest of the fort. And they're not right up against the fort either. No. They're, they're about a mile out, kind of a, a you know, concentric type circle that's set back. Mm-hmm. But the Carondelet is gonna have trouble right off the bat. This, now, yeah. this is the day before the real battle. This is the, so this is, you know, the, the, we're talking about the 13th here. Um, in the Carondelet is an ironclad and then they're going to be sent down. They're going to have some, they're going to have some. Yeah. They, they get to, um, they get a little bit too close. And so the rebels are able to fire upon them, but then because they're too close, the ironclads are going to overshoot their mark and they eventually have to go back downstream again. Yeah, so they're going to get there. Rebs have eight guns, and they're big guns. Yeah. We're not talking about parrots or anything like that. These are big, big guns. Uh, these are Haney's guns. Um, what's interesting about that very first shot is is they both both sides got really one lucky shot in, right? So um, the Carondelet fires, kills a guy named Captain, uh, Captain Dixon. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the second to last shot. The boat's going to fire. It's going to hit a cannon. Uh, the cannon's going to explode, and the piece of the cannon's going to go right through Dixon's head. He ain't going to make it. Yeah. Okay, spoiler alert. He didn't make it. Right. Um, but as, but basically was, was, was walk is backing off in the Cron delay. They're going to get hit by two shots and it's a second to last shot. They fire. So the last one hits the steam heater that starts to hiss. So a bunch of guys pick it up and they throw it overboard and they, they basically sail away. But the very first attempt to kind of get in there and test it out, they get pushed back pretty quick. And they realized they were in for a very formidable attack against these river guns. Yeah, they they realized that, um, you know, taking Fort Donaldson is not going to be the same as taking Fort Henry. It's not going to be a na- it's not going to be a navy thing that that happens. And I think that's mm-hmm. Grant Grant and Foot were banking on that. I think they thought it was basically going to be the same thing. But I don't know if they thought that like oh shit like there was hardly any men at Fort Henry when they get to Donaldson, they've got to know that that's where there's those men have gone and they're facing a much more formidable force than what they faced at Fort Henry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we mentioned before about the, the infantry, right? So CF Smith, okay. Mm-hmm. From Philly. So right off the bat, you yeah. know, that's, he was going to be a very aggressive on that one. He's in charge of the second division on the union left. So he, he's got, he's got Buckner in front of him, right? So what he's going to basically do is he's going to move towards him along the Eddie's, the Eddie'sville road. But the problem too is the maps aren't any good. They must have gone to the, the mobile station and got the crappy map. They must have gone to where the same place Sherman went when he got his exa- map exactly. from Missionary so, Ridge. So he's gonna he's gonna so he's gonna basically take battery D of the first Missouri artillery, 
to file on the red position to find them because he's like oh, i think they're in this area but this map is here so we're, they're gonna fire there um he fires on him but you know what he does then he stops and he has breakfast yeah gotta have your breakfast very important he has God. breakfast so so he has breakfast and then he orders colonel john cook's third brigade and a guy named jacob lawman's fourth brigade to march on buckner's line he's like we think that's where they are so we'll go march on them. you're gonna be in full battle formation now while they're walking, Smith's probably thinking, you know what? I know he told me not to do this, but whatever. He just says, fuck it. He just, he's, he does. So he violates Grant's orders. Um, the attack is kind of an inconclusive. They kind of got, they got to yeah. push back a little bit. But again, um, they did find where they were though. They did. So McLaren on the other side, he's going to basically be marching along. And as he's walking down a road called the Wind Fairies, Wind Fairies and Pyrenees Roads, uh, walk heading towards Dover, they're going to take they're going to take artillery fire as they're walking so um it's going to hit them right basically right in their flank as they're trying to march um they reach a place called dudley's hill and they can they're they recklessly expose themselves and they're, so next thing you know they're, they're in view of the artillery so they start to take hit um basically a guy named uh, there was a uh, captain Maney's batteries up there he's basically drilling these soldiers as they're mm. going because they're just marching by and they're getting hit so what McLaren does similar to what Smith does. He goes against orders in the orders of brigade to go and attack the rebel guns right yep. on them. So, you know, not going to work out well. Picks a guy named William Morrison, who was probably his weakest brigade commander. And within 15 minutes, they get shredded. Yeah. 150 dead. And, and basically, it's kind of a bummer story, too, because they're in an open field and the guns have started fire. So it's almost like a wilderness situation where the yep. fires are engulfing the, the you know, the, the wounded. Um, and that night, you know, that night, the temperature starts to get really cold. So now it's the night of the 13th and it's freezing. So these rebels are hearing the sounds of these screaming guys, the fire, it's cold. And, yeah. you know, um, so they actually, you know, they go against orders and jump the lines and they go and start to save these the union guys like the, 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 i don't want to listen to this anymore so they go and pull some guys back so it's kind of a um an angel of marie's heights type situation um but it's something that um again they both pay the price but especially mclaren and for going directly against grant's orders yeah yeah just to go and attack and then the next day is um like this was the last thing that grant had wanted was an attack like this that's why we have orders yeah perhaps you <laughs> and he's like what them. the fuck is going on <laughs> you know you know um but but you know but that night you know it's cold it's, it's just freezing snowy mm -hmm. and you know the one thing about the civil war stuff mary is people don't talk about the weather enough they no. really don't so this is a night we, you're talking between 10 and 15 degrees it's snowy it's sleet it's freezing rain these guys don't forget what do they did? They drop their blankets and yeah. coats to go faster. Now they're screwed, right? Yeah. So they don't have that with them. So they're told not to light fires, and a lot of them do anyway, because apparently nobody else is following orders. I'm not going to do it either. So it's either freeze to death or light a fire and get shot at. But at least, yeah. at least I'll be warm. I guess that was the attitude. It, it's had. so similar to the mud march, though. You know, yeah. it's very, very similar, and it's also similar to, you know, there. There's been other times too. Um, I think battles for Chattanooga, it got pretty cold. Um, battle for battle Chickamauga, it gets really cold that night in September. There's a frost and the men don't mm -hmm. have any blankets and they have to just basically where, where they were fighting, that's where they sleep. And when they woke up in the morning, like their clothes were frozen and everything else. And that's very similar to what these guys are going through. Except these guys had a real battle that was, that was coming. So, yeah. you know, the night, the next morning is February 14th. It's Valentine's day. Perhaps they had some some vinegar valentines to pass to McLaren <laughs> and Smith, perhaps. Maybe they did. Um, but Grant's going to be in his staff at this point <clears throat> around nine o'clock in the morning. They're going to they're going to ride over to the Cumberland River to consult with Foot on his flagship, which is now the USS St. Louis. <clears throat> and again, they're talking about the fact that okay, we had a tough day yesterday on with the Carondelet, but we still think it could be like Fort Henry if we do this thing right. So he's going to basically tell the troops the boats to leave the transports just along the Cumberland River um, and to help uh, go back to the, to go back to the infantry guys, to, to those troops surrounding the fort. He tells Foote what he wants to do is he wants to run the boats past the rebel gun positions to, to basically to draw enfilade fire. So he's going to basically tell him to run the gauntlet is what he's going to do. Yeah. Um, he also wisely 
or is Wallace from Fort Henry to come. So instead of he was back guarding Fort Henry, now he directs him. You need to come up here. You need to get. You need to basically get between McLaren and and, and, um, and C. F. Smith to help support because we're gonna yeah. we're gonna need more guys. Uh, get here as fast as you can, um, and he'll be he'll be more than glad he did that when this whole thing was over. Oh yeah, because Wallace is one of the MVPs of this battle. And the mm-hmm. other thing too that Grant does is he goes over to see McLaren and. And Grant just says the position on the right must be retaken. Yeah, and yeah. He, he he does. He you know. and Grant basically says the one who attacks now will be victorious. So he's he's ready to go. So he he goes and tells Foot, um, in Foot Foot's like, listen, can we just wait? I got a I got a boat coming with some mm-hmm. more guys. I want these mortars. Can we just wait? Till he gets here and Grant says, no, I want you to freaking go, just go. So Foot grumbles a little bit, but agrees to go. Um, I do this, but, but under protest. And so he decides he's going to go. Um, he's going to sail down the Cumberland to Fort Donaldson. So the Rebs, in the Rebs' defense, literally and figuratively, they they anticipate this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. So those those river guns, they're manned all night. They're ready to go. Um, there's a guy named Captain Reuben Ross. He's the guy who's in charge now that Dixon's, you know, Dixon didn't make it. What does he do? Okay. He's standing there early in the morning. He looks across the river. What does he see? He sees smoke on the water. Not sure if you saw fire in the sky, Mary. <laughs> I was just thinking that. Okay. <laughs> just who knows? Maybe he did. He did a little, pur- little deep purple action for you. So he goes and he tells Floyd at the rebel headquarters, um, hey, just so you know, there's smoke. So the, I think the boats are coming. Floyd is too busy. He's got too much stuff to do. So yep. he, he's messaging with Johnston at the time. And he's, he's telling them, that, look, I'm facing 40,000 Yankees. I don't know how he counts them. He's got 40,000 Yankees, but he goes, I'll, I'll fight them. We're going to fight this evening. So he's, um, he's, they're trying to decide, well, we're pinned here. So we're going to attack Grant's line. I've got, I've got Pillow, I've got Buckner, I've got Bushrod Johnson. Um, they're deciding how they're going to do this. At that moment, Foots boats arrive. So it kind of changes their plans a little bit. Um, you know, there's that story, there's this quotes about how they were on foot's boats and put sand on the decks to present, yeah. you know, to make it the blood doesn't go everywhere. So at 2 p.m., the ironclads do arrive. This would be the St. Louis, the Louisville, the Pittsburgh, and the Carondelet, who's now been repaired. So they're going to lead the attack, followed by the USS Tyler and the Constadoga. I don't said that one right, but that's, that's what that was. And um, the other thing too, that is really interesting about this battle is like Lou Wallace writes about it afterwards. And he talks a lot about CF Smith's performance and CF Smith is he's 55 years old. He's Grant's old commandant from West Point Mm -hmm. and Grant felt a little bit odd at first, you know, having to be in charge of the guy who used to be in charge of him. But um, I think Smith in some ways gets to, gets the union MVP at this battle as well, because he's, you know, out there leading his men. Um, Lou Wallace said that um, the air about him twittered with mini balls um, erect as if on review, he rode on timing the gait of his horse with the movement of his colors. And um he said that one soldier said, I was nearly scared to death, but I saw the old man's white mustache over his, sol- over his shoulder and went on. So Smith, Smith is able to help rally these troops mm-hmm. um, back together. And Wallace said that he picked a path through the jagged limbs of trees, holding his cap all the time in sight, and the effect was magical. The men swarmed in after him, not all of them, alas, up the ascent he rode and up they followed. At the last moment, the keepers of the rifle pits clamored out and fled. So this is when the, the Confederates do start retreating as well. They do, they do. But the action's not over in the water yet, though. No. I mean, basically, Foot is coming down, and Foot makes a really bad mistake. And mm-hmm. what he does, he stops the boats about 400 yards away from the shore and anchors them, thinking he's going to park the boats and it's going to start unloading on them, Fort Henry style. So the boats at that, this point are sitting ducks. So Captain Ross, we mentioned before, he opens up on these gunboats, just bang, 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 right? And these ironclads are just punished. They're getting just drilled. Um, foots aboard the USS St. Louis. He's hit, ironically, in the foot with a shell piece, that same shell piece that actually killed the, the pilot of that boat. Yep. Um, all the boats um, begin to float back up the river again. Um, the Carondelet is the last one to go. 
but they have a, a the, the Rebs had a 50% hit rate, which is unheard of at, at this That's time. Crazy. So, so 50% of all these rebel guns, big guns were hitting their targets. So that fails again. So it goes back up. So uh, night approaches on the 14th in the union soldiers, these guys in Smith and uh, McLaren and eventually Wallace's uh, divisions, they can hear the Rebs cheering. Cause they think they, I don't know how the hell we did this, but we won this, you know, um, they're, they're cheering. Basically it's the high point of the Confederacy at Donaldson at this very moment. It's going to go bad, but at this very moment, they, the guns that just scuttled Fort Henry, they pushed away. So that night, um, that night's probably a low mark again for the union. Yeah. And that night is the high mark for the Confederacy, but the generals, the Rebs, they, they're not stupid though. They know, that they have no chance. They do. Um, Grant does. He starts to realize at this point that it's not going to be easy. He writes to Julia, "The taking of Fort Donelson bids fair to be a long job." Yep. That's what he writes. So, so then he knows. He knows they're probably going to win this, but he also knows it's not going to be easy. Yeah. No, it's a very long, drawn out affair for them, and it's that night that there's a they hold a council of war at Donelson. Mm-hmm. It's, it's funny because, you know, you got to think, you know, you're John Floyd, right? Yeah. And you're excited you won this. He wires Albert Sidney Johnson, basically saying, hey, we won, we won, we won. And Johnson responds back, that's great. But if you lose the fort, bring your troops to Nashville as fast as you can. So he's basically saying, listen, <laughs> you know, like Han Solo style, don't get cocky, kid. Yeah. Because he knows, he knows what's coming. Um, so in that council of war, they decide, very similar to Gettysburg again. Do we stay or do we go, right? Because um, they realize they're still surrounded. So that the boats are gone, but they're still pinned against the Cumberland. They've got now three divisions, because Wallace has arrived, that are surrounding them. So they know they know that the, the prospects are not good. Gideon Pillow, you know, being the, who he is, says, yep. let's stay and fight. The others all vote to go, <laughs> take yep. off. Um, so they decide what they're going to do. Is they're going to do it? They're going to leave. Under, the, under a cover of a surprise attack the next morning. So what basically what they want to do, they're going to move all their troops from the Confederate right to the Confederate left. They're going to burst through the Union line, Kool-Aid man style, yep. right <laughs> through the wall, okay? And they're going to start heading back towards Fort Henry, get the hell out of Dodge. That's the plan. Um, of course, Bushrod Johnson is sitting there just shaking his head, thinking this plan is not going to freaking work, but that they all vote. Yep, but whatever. Yep, and that's... and. This is also where, um, you know, like Floyd and Pillow want to get out of there for other reasons too. Yeah. They're both we'll wanted into, men. Yeah, like we'll, Floyd we'll, is we'll, like, we'll, fuck, I cannot be captured at we'll get all. Into that. Like we'll he, get that towards the end of this, but it's, yeah. it's hilarious that these, they're already looking to save their skin. So February 15th is a Saturday morning. Um, the Rebs are going to plan for an early morning attack. Um, and this is where the weather actually helps the Rebs, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's it's snowy and windy. So as um, so basically as as, as um, Pillow's guys begin to move from from the Confederate right to the left and get into position, the Union guys can't hear them moving just because it's windy and it's cold. They mm-hmm. can't hear it. Um, Buckner's going to be on the Rebel right. He um, he basically they're going to ultimately leave one regiment back to cover. So you're going to have like 450 guys to hold off Smith's entire division. So they're just basically a bump in the road at that point. Um, Pillow and Johnson do finally begin their attack. Um, Buckner's still not in position. He's who the hell he is, but he's, but he's got, he's got a little bit of, a little bit of room to travel. So he's got a little bit of time to go in those icy roads. Um, and McLaren, he yep. wakes up to the sound of the rebel yell. That's what he wakes up to. Yeah. You know? And his troops are very poorly positioned. Um, mm-hmm. And he's going to experience a flanking attack from Forrest. Forrest is going day. to get. He's going to get him. He's going to get behind him. He's going to get all. He's going to go all up in there. Is what he's going to get. And this is actually where John MacArthur's fighting here too. Yeah. Yep. He yeah. makes it. He's made an appearance at a few battles that we've talked yeah. about in the Western Theater. So this ends up being a complete, just a complete slugfest. Um, by eight o'clock in the morning, McLaren's retreating. He's getting pushed back. Um, a lot of these soldiers are, are out of ammo. The 18th Illinois was completely out of ammunition. They've lost everything. But you, to your point, they're getting flanked and attacked from all angles. They are, yeah. Um, and so at this point, he decides to uh, phone a friend. 
he messages Lou Wallace for help and says, Hey, um, can you do me a, can you do me a huge solid? Can you help me out and get, yep. get my ass kicked here? So Wallace basically says, I don't take orders from you. I, we got I, Grant told me I got to wait. So they go, well, let's go find Grant and guess where Grant is. They don't know. Grant ain't there. No. It's like a Yuka. He's not there. Right. Grant is back with foot on his boat. Right. So it's almost like a, you know, and he can't hear the attack going on because the, the that's just the, the distance, yeah. the woods, the way. So it's almost like a picketed five fork situation. So there's an attack going on that's threatening his divisions and he doesn't know about it. He can't hear it. Um, the wood mass of sounds, the battles. So where foot and grant are, they, they can't hear us. So this is all going on. Yeah. Um, the, the morning continues and, you know, um, pillow and Johnson are, which sounds like a bad law firm, by the way, they're on the verge of, they're on the verge of a breakthrough. Um, the feds are out of supplies, out of ammo, and they're almost got it. The revs almost have it. Um, yeah. and the feds get pushed all the way back. Um, two of three McLaren's brigades are destroyed. Basically one is, is running. Um, but everything's going is everything's going great for the Confederates at mm-hmm. this point. The soldiers are ready to go. Let's go, go, go. But this is where the generals and their little attitudes come back to haunt the Confederates. It does, so yeah. The soldiers are ready to go, but the generals are not ready. And so they waste two hours, two hours standing around. The soldiers are milling around, waiting for the next move. They're almost, it's like you're you burst out of, of, of prison, right? Yeah. And you get past the gate and you just got to go 10 feet to the road and get in the car that's going to take you away. And they say, you just wait right there. And they wait and they wait and they wait. Um, and so it ends up being a delay that for, that's going to ultimately cost them. So mm-hmm. Pillow, Buckner, and Johnson are all squabbling. Pillow's pissed at Buckner for not breaking the line. Again, Buckner thinks he should have rank over Pillow for whatever reason. They don't want to take orders from each other. And so you can kind of see, um, you can kind of see what's going on. Yeah. And I made a mistake earlier. <laughs> this is the day that Grant said the one who attacks first will now be victorious. He probably said it a bunch of times, but, <laughs> you know, so, but, but he, but he does. So, but, you know, Lou Wallace to his credit, and this is where you can be good for old Lou. Okay. Yep. He rides in his chariot, Ben-Hur style. He does. And he does. So he does take the initiative at this point. He's like, look, I Grant ain't here. This, this is something bad's going down. I'm going to move my guys. He moves his troops to the right to support McLaren. And yep. he takes position along that Winds Ferry Road to block the rebels and slow their escape. So at this point, the numbers are going against the Confederates. So Pillow starts to realize they missed their chance, basically. He starts to order his troops back to the original entrenchments. Yeah, Floyd. Floyd's going to eventually order all of his guys back from the defensive perimeter, so they get all the way out. Now they're falling back again. Um, now Grant, this is what he learns of the attack. This is when he gets it. So yeah. he finds out, and he rides along. He jumps on his horse and rides on his, his on his icy road fast as he can. He gets there. Um, he sees the troops in complete disarray, and he, he just it's a complete mess. Um, but then he also finds out, he's talks to some rebel prisoners, and he finds out that, hey, I'm, I know you guys all look like you're all screwed, but our guys are worse. You should see us. Yeah. So he's finding out that the rebel, you know, the rebel command and control is a mess. The soldiers have no idea what they're doing either. Um, and this is when, to your point, he decides, okay, we need to take initiative because at this point, whoever mans up takes the initiative is going to mm-hmm. win right now. And so yeah. that's what he does. Yeah, and that's what happens. And that's where you have like C.F. Smith, um coming through as well as like lou wallace and all that and they do manage to to gain back the ground they had lost like by 5 30 uh lou wallace has managed to um retake the ground they had lost that morning and the confederates um have been pushed back to their original positions so um grant does plan at the end of the day to resume his attack in the morning um although he neglects to uh, close the escape route that pillow had had opened up so, so you think about it just picture grant riding up chewing yeah. that cigar this is the, they said this is the first time they really noticed him with the cigars mm-hmm. that they would talk about yeah he's chewing on, on he's on his horse he's chewing on an unlit cigar and he realizes how close he came to screwing up bad yeah just because right? he can't hear the sounds of the battle right? and so like, but but he gets there in time and his credit he he, he saves the day basically he stabilizes the union lines um 
you know, the soldiers basically see him, he gets big and motivated. The mm-hmm. Rebs get to your point, gets pushed back. Um, but just knowing how close the rebels came now, the rebels burst through. I'm not sure what they would have happened, but they would have burned, they should have burst through, but they got stopped. So the well, night of the Lewis, 50, like Lou Wallace coming in fortifying the lines mm-hmm. too really helps. And I think CF Smith was a real like he managed to boost morale with the way that he was riding around yeah. as well. And just picture that night of the 15th, because this was a big mess. Yeah. You know, there was a there was a thousand people dead right there, right? The, the three thousand are lying freezing to death on the cold. It's that another on the cold night. Um, so now it's the early, early hours of February 16th, 1 30 a.m. Basically, Goderich call me maybe time on a, on a Saturday, <laughs> on a early Sunday. Not for morning. the month of February. Nope, nope, nope. But around that time's about right. Yeah, though. you wait for that okay. first weekend in March. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're lucky, mate. <laughs> but basically, F- Floyd's going to hold another council of war at the, at the Dover yeah. Hotel. So he's going to basically say, listen, what do you guys want to do? And this time they all agree. They say, let's get the hell out of here, right? Except Nathan Bedford Forrest. He's yeah. pissed. He's yeah, like, he's, what? Yeah, he's, he's like, like he, he's like, nope. And he's like, I did not come here for the purpose of surrendering my command. Yeah, I ain't, uh, the, the, you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Yeah. So he, he's going to storm out of the meeting, okay? He's going to leave Donaldson. He's going to escape to Nashville. He's going to jump. He's going to cross the frozen Lick Creek, they said. Mm-hmm. He's going to escape over. It's, uh, he's going to leave the dance floor, as you like to say. So he's going to go. Um, so they all agree they're going to they're gonna surrender. They, they have no choice. So yeah. Floyd... He's like, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to surrender, but I'm not going to be the guy. I'm a wanted guy back to back. And I, I got to get the hell out of here. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be arrested. So I can't do it. I'm going to give the job to you, Gideon Pillow. So you're, <laughs> congratulations, you got a promotion. You're in charge. Yeah. Pillow goes, and Pillow's like, you know. No, no, no he doesn't want to do that. it. Because He's Pillow like, had this habit in public of saying, give me liberty or give me death. Yeah. And now he's fearing that if he gets captured, he's going to be the laughing stock of like the Yankees and the Rebs. So he's like, nope. Guess what, Buckner? Yeah. It's he's your like, lucky fucking he's day. Like, he's like, thank you, uh, uh, Floyd. I, I, General Floyd, uh, I, I accept the offer, but I now bestow it to, on you, Simon Buckner. And he goes, hey, Simon, look at that way. And he runs out the other way out the door. Yep. He's, he escapes too. So Buckner, he's like, well, okay, this is my, this is my thing. Buckner, you know, he's, he he accepts I feel bad his faith. for him but you know though he's sister and says he says like yeah okay he accepts his faith yeah so he said he sends he sends a message to grant for terms of to terms of surrender so that's a very famous story we'll talk about yeah but he's hoping that he's merciful to him because before the war when grant was destitute Buckner apparently let him gave him money yep and he's thinking well if i surrender he's he'll remember that Maybe he'll give us a break. So he's going to basically going to do that. So he's going to basically, he's going to basically do this. So what we, what we basically done here is this. So we are going to real quick in, in a nutshell, what he does, he basically asks Grant, what are the, what, what's the deal here? What do we want to do? And Grant does his famous unconditional surrender, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Buckner gets mad. So of course here at the civil war breakfast club world headquarters, what we decided to do was again, <laughs> recreate this letter. So yeah. Just imagine if this would happen today, how this letter would have gone. So um, why don't you be Buckner, okay? Yep. And I will be Grant, and we will um, and we will see how this letter probably went in today's terms. Yeah, so these are text messages that they would have sent. So Obviously. This is Buckner to Grant. <clears throat> hey, buddy. You know, considering how shit is going down right now, how about we discuss how we can work things out here? How about noonish, you know? Um, maybe you can do me a favor and cut me some slack wink emoji (laughs) you know help a fellow out your friend simon grant gets the text message looks at it laughs and he says you know help a brother help someone out how about you drop your linen and start your grinning the only terms i'm accepting is a full french salute simon you don't understand. I am ready to kick ass and smoke cigars, and I have plenty of matches. <laughs> Dude. Well, I'm backed into a fucking corner here. Between Pillow and Floyd noping the fuck out of here because they had a my people need me moment, and the shit you've been throwing at me, and shade apparently, I have no choice. I have no choice 
but to accept your petty, unchivalrous terms. So much for favors. I'll raise the flag, but before I do, middle finger emoji, middle finger emoji, middle finger emoji. Fuck you, Buckner. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that's exactly how it went. So, so, so Buckner does surrender the entire army. Uh, we'll talk about the, the casualty numbers that Mary loves to talk about here in a few minutes. But, but basically, the rebel army is that basically going to be marched to Union prison camps. Now, again, this is the first big Union victory here. So, so this victory resonates in the North big time. It automatically catapults U.S. Grant to star level. Mm -hmm. um, he gets thousands upon thousands of cigars sent to him, just sent to him, which ultimately was his undoing, ironically. He earns a Lincoln administration's complete love. Um, he captured more rebel prisoners than all previous Civil War commanders combined at that point. 12,392 people he bagged. 12,392. That, that, that's a yep. huge, huge number. So um, he gets promoted to major general with the help of a guy named Elihu Washburn. Who, uh, from Illinois, who's a big Lincoln guy who um, ironically died in Galena, Illinois. There you go. Mm -hmm. But he, um, he was a big proponent of Grant and he, he helped get him promoted to major general. And he's going to be put in charge of this new creation called the Army of the Tennessee. And, and this, this will resonate as we go later on. We start talking about things like Shiloh and Corinth and, and it has all the way, all the stuff we've been talking about. But Donaldson falling is basically going to give the, the United States Army the ability to attack further south along the Tennessee River. Yeah. Um, it's going to free Kentucky of all the Rebs. It's going to free up all those cities that are up there now they're, now they're under federal control. Um, it's going to open up all the rivers to the south, like we mentioned before. Um, and what it really does is it really, besides beginning U.S. Grant's cigar habit, by the yeah. way, it really puts him on the national stage now, and it helps offset the bad news that's coming out of the east almost daily. Yeah. So this this is their this is their bright star that's coming out of the west, and as this goes on, and we start to look at things like Shiloh that are coming down the road, these battles like that domino thing you and I always talk about. Yep. These things set up what's going to be coming on later that's going to ultimately help prove that's going to pave the road for grant to go all the way through the list. It says Sherman up and yeah. kind of go from there. Yeah, it does. As you said, there's the domino effect on the, on the Confederate side of things. You have the, like the line that Albert Sidney Johnson had established completely breaks. He's no longer in Kentucky anymore. So he is basically forced to go to Corinth. So he's moving further South. Um, and this battle, this taking of Donaldson and Fort Henry this is why Shiloh happens. If you don't have Henry and Donaldson, then you don't have Shiloh because you're basically forcing the Confederates to break the line that they had established. So at the end of all of this, um, just we'll do the casualty numbers because I'm a morbid person. Um, they're primarily, um, the casualties were heavy because of the Confederate, large Confederate surrender. So union losses are about 2,691. And the Confederates are 13,846, um, with most, most of these being captured or missing. Um, but there's like, this does do something for morale in obviously in, in the North, but it also starts to break it a little bit in, in the South too. But you have somebody like Jeff Davis who realizes just how disastrous this loss is, but he's still doing this thing where he's trying to, you know, typical politician like things are okay this is fine meanwhile there's fire going well. on behind it. yeah exactly this is fine you know the dog <laughs> drinking the coffee that's jefferson davis he said though the tide of movement is against us the final result in our favor is never doubtful it was perhaps in the ordination of providence that we are taught the value of our liberties by the price we pay for them in other words We've lost Henry and Donaldson, but it doesn't mean we're going to lose this fight. And it doesn't mean we're going to lose the war. So basically we've lost the battle, but we have not lost the war um, yet. And as I said, like Johnson's line has collapsed. He is heavily criticized in the newspapers. He's accused of being incompetent, drunk. He's even accused of treason um, in some places. But really when you look back at it, um, like Johnston has been trying to get help from Richmond and it's refused because they don't have the arms to send him that he needs. And he's got insubordinates that are not listening to him when they say, you need to fortify. You need to make sure 
because they could come down the river and attack you. And um, that's what happens. But Davis, which is this is a pattern that we're going to see from him later with Braxton Bragg. Now, Johnston, Albert Sidney Johnson is a very talented general, you know, and I see why Davis stands by him. I think he recognizes that talent. Um, Davis says, if Sidney Johnson is not a general, we had better give up the war for we have no, no general. So what happens is Beauregard and John or Beauregard, sorry, that's what we call him on the podcast. Beauregard and Johnson plan an offensive in Tennessee. Uh, Beauregard says, we must do something or die in the attempt. Otherwise all will be shortly lost. In the North, Halleck is gonna to actually take a little bit of credit <laughs> for these victories as well. So it's not all just on, on Grant. Um, so he is gonna send, Halleck is going to send Grant to a place called Pittsburgh Landing, 20 miles north of Corinth. He orders Buell to join him there with 35,000 troops. And Halleck plans on going there eventually as field commander to lead them against Corinth. So that's where this is going to wrap up, is a place called Pittsburgh Landing. Well, and you're going to, they're going to be running into an angry bunch of Confederates who want to throw them out of Tennessee. Yeah. So they, the Confederates are embarrassed by the way the whole Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry thing worked out. Um, they don't want these guys in their, their backyard. So you're going to get guys like Beauregard and these guys are going to get together and say, we've got to push the Confederates out of Pittsburgh Landing. They're going to meet on April 4th, a place called Shiloh, that we're going to talk later on about. And that's going to be really the, the, the revenge in their minds of the Confederates. This is going to be their way to get back after, after Fort Donaldson. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll not to spoil the ending, but it ain't going to work out too well, but we'll no. talk about that in more detail. But I think what it does, Shiloh does not happen if Donaldson doesn't happen. Yeah. So Donaldson, Donaldson doesn't happen if Henry doesn't happen. And Henry doesn't happen if Grant doesn't go to hell like a, with foot and say, we, we want to do this. Yeah. So it all goes back to these initial decisions about why sometimes, and sometimes you get lucky. Um, and this time they, they, they got lucky, but they got good, right? Yeah. Um, everything worked out well for them. And it's yeah. going to really set the stage in the West because these, it does. This, this area in the West is really what's going to set um, the action in motion that's going to basically go through the rest of the war. Yeah. And I think that the, the couple takeaways from, from just, you know, studying this battle that it does often what gets talked about the most is on conditional surrender grant. It's not really looked at how close they could have come to disaster here, you know, but you have men like Lou Wallace and even, and Smith that are kind of, they're the union MVPs in this battle that are there to, to save the day. Right. And grant too. I mean, grant, Grant was a good one to have in charge here, obviously, too. But the other thing to remember to note as well is the incompetence on the Confederate side. Well, it just goes to show you can have the best players on the team, but yeah. if they all hate each other, you're not exactly. going to win. And yeah. the, the, the pillow and the Buckner thing is a real thing. And, and, and really, it really showed, you know, at the worst possible moment, mm -hmm. right? When they were basically going to finally they were gonna burst through, it was in. It just just because of personal vendettas and not wanting to take orders from each other, um, they had their chance. They really did, and they let it slip away. And then, to Grant's credit, to your point, this is really really becomes U.S. Grant at this yeah. moment. Picture him riding up with a cigar in his mouth, directing people around. At that point on, he really never turned around again. As far as is turned back, I mean, he was he really was the one who became forceful. It really became U.S. Grant's the one that he gets all the credit for. Yeah, but it could have gone the other way so easily. Oh, it could have. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you have to remember men like Lou Wallace in this battle, too, that, you know, and Lou Wallace, as we're going to talk about at Shiloh down the road, he's not going to come out of that battle with a very good reputation, unfortunately, you know, only as good as your next day. Right. Yeah. Exactly. As good as your next day. Lick him Lou tomorrow. Wallace. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So anyway, so I think that's a, a good place to, to leave, yeah. leave the leave the boys on Pittsburgh Landing, yeah. get, heading down there and getting ready to head down there for a while. So. So I think at the end of the day, it really tells a really good in-depth story of the beginning stages, the you know, the uh, the prequel of Shiloh. Yeah. And so in a couple of weeks, when the weather gets warm, hopefully finally, we will um we will talk about Shiloh. And rumor has it, it's going to be a two-parter. It's going to be a two-parter. Yep. And that's what the boss says. Two hours. So she says two-parter. <laughs> it's two-parter. So anyway, I think that's um a great day. So Mary, this is uh, good time as always mm -hmm. doing this. So we look yep. forward to the next one. So again. By the time this drops on Saturday, we will have our 
fifth, I can't believe it's fifth one yep, already, fifth the round, round table. table. Yep. Mm -hmm. We'll have our, we'll have our live and then we'll, the book club will be here before we know it. Yep. Right in the, the March. So, yep. In the March. So anyway, thanks to every, thanks to everybody for listening. We appreciate it as always. 27 episodes is in the book. Holy yep. moly, 27. You've been deal with you for 27 weeks wow yeah i Better have and i'm not drinking right now either oh yeah you're much more fun sober i'll tell you ah, anyway, but, but regardless it's um it's a good thing so anyway so again thanks everybody we appreciate it so coming attractions we will be looking at meridian campaign next week meridian, setting you up there and so then, you pay attention yep and then p ridge and then i think we're doing um kernstown yeah, we'll be doing a lot of fun stuff. So we have yeah. a lot of fun stuff coming down the road. So again, thanks for listening. We look forward to uh, to the next one. Mary, great to see you as always. Once you again, too. as I say many times, the pleasure was all yours. And we will um, look forward to talking to you next time. Yep. Everybody have a wonderful Saturday and we will see you all again soon. Peace out. Yeah, bye.